what? Life runs on information and sunlight. How does nature influence movement through shape? How does nature redirect fluid flow? Redirect, that's interesting. You know how when you walk, it it's really windy in a field and then you walk into a forest, what happens? So those feedback loops are what constantly keep nature from going overboard on stuff or expending too much energy. So there's, there's so many strategies, but what you have to do is this form of empathy, which is you start with, what are your lives like? What are you doing? And then realize there's no separation between what they're doing and what we're doing. That's a false boundary. They just do it in a different way that we're trying to learn how to do. I started collecting for biomimicry in 1990, the book. Yeah, I began to see these this sort of faint signal in the scientific literature that people who were studying leaves, for instance, were starting to work with solar cell manufacturers, right? To, to say, you know, how does, a, how does a leaf gather the sun's energy so, so well and turn it into chemistries? And when I saw that happen, I, I collected it. Um, that started in 1990 and it culminated in, in Biomimicry and Innovation Inspired by Nature, the book in 1997. So biomimicry is innovation inspired by nature. And it's a new way of inventing by looking to the natural world for our inspiration. For how, and asking before we design anything, um, what would nature do here? When we're doing biomimicry is we're looking for nature's designs, you know, its structures and its forms, because they're so elegant, they're so energy efficient. We're looking at its processes, its recipes and the chemistries that are so life friendly. And then we're also looking at its strategies on an ecosystem level, right? How do all these organisms interact in a way that enhances this place? And by looking to the natural world for our models, and as our mentor, what we're trying to do is emulate that to create a more sustainable world, more sustainable products, policies, right? new ways of living that will allow us to live more gracefully on this planet. You know, we're using too many materials, too much energy, too many toxins. How does nature do it? It's a way to seek sustainable solutions. And it still is a fairly new, it's a fairly new way of inventing. Um, in the last 20 years, it's spread throughout the design and engineering communities. You know, it's the beginning of its journey. It's an exciting, emerging discipline. And we've begun to naturalize it in the culture. When Dana Baumeister and I were first starting, and we realized, you know, when there's an emerging discipline, um, where, do you, where do you start? to naturalize it in the culture and to build all the, all the institutions that an emerging discipline needs. And what we said was that, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is take the ideas from the natural world, the wisdom from the natural world, and let it flow into human systems design, design of everything. Um, and so we needed to create a flow structure that's how nature would do it, right? Something that would use, that would, that would easily flow from one to the other. And the most important impulse was to get people to ask, how would nature do this? And then once they asked, we had to make sure that they would have a way to find an answer. And that became tools like Ask Nature, methodologies about going outside and, and how you look and how you observe ways to go through the biological literature. I, I called it, there needs to be some sort of an innovation matchmaking service, right? Because I realized that the people who make our world, you know, the engineers and product designers, they don't take biology in, in school. It just doesn't happen. So they're creating, creating a pump that's run by an internal combustion engine, but they've never learned about the whale heart. 
which is an incredible pump that pumps, you know, 65,000 miles of arteries and capillaries. Biologists know about it, but the people who make pumps don't. So it was creating this, uh, this place where biological knowledge and intelligence could easily be accessed at the moment of creation. That became asknature.org. One of the things we said was, let's get biomimicry into the educational process. And what we learned was the way that biomimicry is best taught is through practice. So that's when we went to this idea of a design challenge as a way of teaching. Because biomimicry is not a body of work that you download, that you read in a textbook. You have to do it, actually, and then you get it. So it's starting to happen. We're starting to put that into place with, with this design challenge. I'm John Lanier. I'm the executive director of the Ray C. Anderson Foundation. My grandfather was Ray Anderson. Ray founded Interface, the world's largest carpet tile manufacturing company, and he spent the last 17 years of his life trying to make his business as environmentally sustainable as possible. And along that journey that he and the company took, he was always looking for teachers, people who could help him along the way towards sustainability. Janine Benyus was one of those teachers, and then she taught Ray to learn from nature. Biomimicry is such a big part of what my grandfather's story was about. And when he passed away, left his estate to this family foundation. We very strongly believe that we need more entrepreneurs to understand that nature really is the best teacher. It's something that, that Ray understood very well. And when we learned that the Biomimicry Institute had been doing a student design challenge for some time, that was the beginning of a much bigger idea because there are so many people who have the entrepreneurial bug, but have not yet learned how to be expert biomimics. If we can empower them, you begin to see the makings of systems change. People begin to realize that what nature has to teach is more than we've ever imagined. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change says we have 10 years to transition to regenerative economies sustained by resilient communities. Design inspired by nature is inherently regenerative, inherently resilient, making it a viable means to meet those goals. You know, we're using too many materials, too much energy, too many toxins. How does nature do it? My name is Paulina Villacresas. Um, I'm from Ecuador. And my name is Anna Gannett. I'm Simar Kohli Das from India. I'm Tarun Kumar from Bangalore, India. My name is Albert Gonzalez. I'm Tim Enslow. My name is Yu Wu, and this is Tian Shu Wang. My name is Joe Pugar. I'm the CEO and co founder of Aruga Technologies. My name is Amr. Uh, I'm an architect. I'm Wenxi. I come from China. My name is Bruno Rutman. My name is Pedro Hutchman and from nuclear company, yeah. So we started with this problem of climate change. We identified the population of mosquitoes were increasing in some areas of the world. So that's where we really started with that problem of mosquito populations. We decided to ask nature, what can we do to trap unwanted populations? We found that there's this bladderwort or Utricularia vulgaris. It's a carnivorous plant that's underwater and basically has these, these hairs that are very sensitive. So when a larvae is closer to these hairs, the trap opens and it traps the larvae. And then through photosynthesis, it digests the, the larvae and turns it into nutrients. So inspired on that, we wanted to mimic that behavior and so we created the U-Pod, which is a mosquito control device that is solar paneled um, and it has two compartments, an air chamber and a water chamber. What it does, it has a pump that triggers a trapdoor through a smart sensor that lets uh, water and larvae in and once the water chamber is full, uh, the trapdoor closes and basically 
the larvae are, are left with no oxygen supply and they drown. The trap system resets uh, its cycle and the water and larvae are expelled and new water and new larvae um, come into the water chamber and that's how it functions. So we're working on a product that would help um, lower the uh, lower the temperature inside buildings, uh, being able to be retrofitted onto the face of the outside exterior of a wall. Uh, it would lower the temperature inside and it's a passive system that doesn't require the use of electricity. So we actually, every layer of our project, it uses separate creatures to mimic. The first layer is inspired by the cactus, the wavy pattern that's on the front of our device, creates a shade, reduce heat, and then we have a second layer that is very porous, allows for air to get brought into the system to cool it down, and that one's inspired by the termites. And then our final layer is a water layer that uses the same technique that we use to pull up the water so that that water can then evaporate and also cool down the surface of the wall. From the big front of it to the back of it, we know it cools up to about 30 degrees. We got some tests that went a little higher when it got hotter, but like on average, it's about a 30 degree difference and it's only about three inches thick. So it's really right now, and this is like macro scale so we could actually build it and test it. So if we were to manufacture it, it'd probably be only like one or two inches thick and hopefully would have their same result. We work on wastewater sewage treatment. We developed a technology to treat wastewater sewage without using power. So that's what we, we do. What we do is we've taken inspiration from the stomach of a cow and try to replicate that underground. So what we do is we treat the wastewater without power or machinery using anaerobic bacteria that is present in the cow's stomach as well. So it's a digestive system for the wastewater. Uh, what we're trying to do is treat sewage in the more decentralized way, closer to the source, without machinery, chemicals, and safeguarding the lives of operators. And also the sludge that is being created carries a lot of uh, pathogens in conventional STPs, uh, unlike anaerobic systems like ours that actually eats and digests all these things. And we've came out with a solution and we are hoping to make a difference. Our company is about helping water utilities to find leaks in their water pipes, save water and protect their infrastructure. We use a robotic tool that we can use to put into water pipes and help those water companies identify the location of leaks before those leaks become catastrophic failures. We all started as traditional engineering major students. We tried all traditional engineering principles. It turns out none of them worked, so we had to take a radically different approach, and that's when we started to look at soft material robot. Then we built a robot that works very much like a squid, that can squeeze through water pipes, and then measure leaks through a suction force. And this is our inspiration from nature to solve this particular problem. We can transform that uh, uh, interesting point from the nature to the industry point. That's quite inspiring for, for us, yes. We actually look to how our own native arteries in our own body remain so clean from blood clot and other platelets that would accumulate on the surface normally. So what we've actually discovered through histology or the study of veins, and we've seen this pattern in other places in nature, such as dolphin and shark skin or even mussels in the ocean, is that this is a self-cleaning surface and that different animals and organisms use this in order to keep themselves clean in harsh adhesive environments. So several of the, or one of the applications we're really driving for has been in water treatment, reverse osmosis, or uh, desalinization. The hope would be to put these self-cleaning features on membranes used for the filtration process. And by having a self-cleaning surface, you're improving the lifetime of these filters, as well as making them more effective. We had, we had done the, um design challenge for several years, and the ideas were amazing. But people graduated, they went on. They didn't have the business help to be able to know how to make it into an actual business or service or product. Um, and 
and we knew that, that there was a gap there. We would like to take these amazing ideas, turn them into real products, commercialize them. So the launch pad are the people out of all of our applications. These are the people who we believe have the best chance to make a business out of their ideas. So they are learning not just biomimicry, but they're also learning business skills. They're getting a mini MBA here in how to come up with a business model, how to come up with a business plan, how to present your materials for investors. We also, we're asking them to get to the prototype stage, which is a lot more than just ideas on a CAD CAM program or on paper. Of these teams, the winner will be presented with a $100,000 Ray of Hope prize. That's at a point where investors might say, okay, um, this looks like something that might work. So that $100,000 should attract other money as well. It'll get folks to even the next level of, of their work. And we've seen that happen. We felt that by creating a grand prize, what we call the, the Ray of Hope prize, $100,000 to the best team, that that creates an incentive of bringing a biomimetic innovation to life. Now please help me congratulate the winners of the 2018 Ray of Hope first prize, brothers Bruno and Pedro Rutman Pagnoncelli of Nucleario in Brazil. Now I'd like to invite all six of the teams from the Biomimicry Launchpad on stage. Please join me in congratulating all of them. We won, yeah. We are super proud. For sure, the, 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 the prize will help, help a lot in our development, in our next steps. Nuclear is based and inspired by nature. And our, our users are the trees, are the small trees, the seedlings. But not only the trees, but uh, the field workers too. Yeah, oh, we are improving the field workers' life. The biggest bottleneck at the forest restoration process is the maintenance. We need a lot of labor, and those heroes, they are working every day at the fields. But we want to improve their labor because the demand for forest restoration is huge. So we want to put their jobs just to be planting trees. We are supplying them with a new technology, a, a new device, to, so with that they can plant uh, faster, smarter, and cheaper too. During this year, business and the biomimicry and the design itself, so yeah, we learned a lot with them. Biomimicry at scale is transformational. Coming here, it was really nice to meet a bunch of other people who also design and look for new solutions in nature. The walk on the Blackfoot River, I loved every minute of it. It was really nice just to see like Janine's personal take on it and how much it meant to her. And it was just inspiring all around. And, and also learning from the other participants. So we're just kind of completing each other's work and, and it's really good to be a part of this network. Um, but what I think is a great opportunity and what I get really excited about, especially in biomimicry technologies, is what we're doing is we're bringing nature now to the everyday person. And at the end of the day, there's that beautiful flow and there's more sustainable products. There's people who know how to practice biomimicry. But even more importantly to me, there's a whole group of people who have a heightened respect for the natural world. This way of inventing, you know, in 20 years, we look back and this is just good design. It's not biomimetic design, it's just good design. It mimics the amazing things that have been evolved over 3.8 billion years. At that point, we will have fulfilled this mission, right? 
and hopefully there's a amazing amounts of systems of solutions, all of which you can say thank you to for the idea, right? And those organisms' habitats are being conserved because we're just so grateful. And we want to see what the next genius idea is going to be, right? That's what I would love in 20 years.